is just the worst spot to be in. Because on the schedule, I'm following Jesus. <laughs> the God of the universe was my opener. It's like if you have to give a presentation in English class and you're all stoked for your presentation, And the person gets up in front of you, and they say, I'm going to give a presentation today about my grandfather who beat cancer and was a war hero. And they give this amazing presentation, and then you've got to get up, and you're like, I'm here to talk about my dog. <laughs> uh, spot. That's how I feel right now. I was here 20 years ago on almost the exact same date. And to prove it, I brought a picture. Can we toss that picture up on the screen? That's me at Steubenville, St. Louis, which is now Steubenville Mid-America in 2001 on July 7th, 2001, almost 20 years to the date today. And you'll notice that I look like a Steubenville teenager, right? You like that shirt? It looks like Coca-Cola, but it says Catholic. And then underneath it, it says the real thing, because that was Coca-Cola's slogan for a while. My youth minister, Jim, made it, and he's a great, great man, but he's not super creative. And that's the shirt we wore. That was our big Saturday shirt. I also still have the journal from that weekend. And you never bring your freshman journal with you anywhere. But I did take a picture of it. And this is the first entry. Now I want you to know something about this journal. I was dating somebody named Rebecca at that time. And the first entry takes place on July 4th. So that's the entry I have here. And I just spent a wonderful July 4th with my girlfriend, Rebecca. But we were going to be apart for a week because she was going on vacation with her family and I was going here. And how were we ever going to make it? I don't know. So the journal was actually me <laughs> writing notes back to her. Don't awe that. <laughs> it was lame. It was not okay. Here's the first journal entry. Dear Becca, so I'm here writing in my Steubenville journal the night before Steubenville. Oh, well, I guess. <laughs> Babysitter club line is that? Okay. I just dropped you off at your house. It's always hard to say goodbye. <laughs> I should have read this closer. <laughs> I'm so nervous for this trip. I wonder why I'm writing instead of being in bed. To be honest, I don't know what to think of this whole thing. I'd rather stay at home here where I know and understand things. It's odd to think I won't even be at Steubenville until Friday. Uh, we left a day early and stayed overnight because we traveled, actually. I, I grew up in Wisconsin, so we traveled all the way from there. I thought you were here, and I figured you'd be over there. So we had to travel a day early. I don't know anybody, and I'm not close enough with anyone to talk to you, so this journal is going to have to serve as that. God, I'm so nervous. I'm afraid of what's going to happen there, but more importantly, I'm afraid of who I might encounter. I'm afraid I might actually come face to face with God. Got pretty profound at the end. For somebody who started off being like, oh, that's my journal. Oh, well, I guess. <laughs> I wish I could go back, you know? like 20 years and, and go to that kid uh, at writing in this journal as a freshman, going to be a sophomore in high school, go back to this young man and, and say a couple things to him like, hey, you don't need to wear a white t-shirt under that t-shirt. <laughs> it's hot and humid. You don't need to double shirt, buddy. Just put on deodorant. It's going to be fine. I'd probably encourage him because you see that first year at Steubenville, we slept on a gym floor. And when I say we slept on the gym floor, I mean me and 300 other guys. There were three showers for us. 
But I'd encourage freshman Joel and I'd say, you're going to shower every single day. You'll get up at 5 a.m. to do it, but that's the right thing to do. I'd give him some practical advice. Like, you know, your beard is going to come in one day, but if you try to grow it out too soon, it's going to look patchy and very bad. You'll look like a sick dog with mange. Don't do that. I'd tell him to keep that t-shirt. I would tell him that holiness is not about being perfect, but it's a journey. It's a place that you never really arrive at, but a destination to which you will strive towards. I would tell him that the quality of his friends are going to determine the quality of his life. And after that conference, he'll have some decisions to make that will be important, that will impact the quality of his life. But there's one thing I wouldn't tell him. I would not tell him that that weekend was going to change his life. Now, here's the thing. It did change my life. That weekend at Steubenville, St. Louis, changed the trajectory that I was on. But sometimes when you tell people that, you actually set them up for disappointment, right? And here's one thing. I think we have moments that we have big expectations for that we really pour into and we say, oh, this is going to be a big thing. This is going to be a big deal. And then we kind of get let down. Prom is that way. I think everybody deserves to experience the disappointment of how lame prom actually is. Now, maybe I'm bitter because I only went to one prom and the person I asked said yes. And then a couple weeks later, she was like, no, I want to go with my ex-boyfriend and I had to turn in my couple's ticket for a single ticket. I don't think about it anymore. <laughs> huh. Oh, well, I guess. Um, <laughs> but prom's one of those things. Like everybody pumps up this event and it's supposed to be this great thing. You maybe hear people say things like, oh, it's going to be the greatest night of our lives. Really? Your whole life. And then it happens, and you're kind of like, I guess that was okay. So I wouldn't pump it up that much with young freshman Joel. Like, this weekend doesn't change your life. There are other moments like that, because the, the moments that change our life, actually, if you think about this, when we have these moments, we don't always know exactly what they are. When did you meet your best friend? Did you know they were your best friend? I bet the moment that you met your best friend, like the person you're closest to, you didn't really have any idea what that friendship was going to be. You probably didn't go home and write in your journal, I met my best friend today. It was just a person. And then you kind of got close, maybe. Is this my headset doing this? Or is God speaking to me? I'm not entirely sure. It's the beard. It speaks on its own for me. You have moments like that. Moments that become big but aren't big at the time. They're subtle. They're unexpected. Sometimes they're really good things, like you meet your best friend. Sometimes they're, uh, they're moments where you discover a new skill or a new hobby. Sometimes they're not so good, like the moment your parents start to have trouble in their marriage or somebody starts to get sick. In fact, this whole past year has been one of those unexpected moments that nobody really was bracing for or understood. Nobody was ready for that. But this unexpected thing happened and really shook up our world. And when I say last year, I mean everything about last year. Well, all that we experienced, we had a worldwide pandemic. I was flying the day everything kind of fell apart in the United States. That was a weird day to fly. I took off from Phoenix in the morning and landed in Atlanta three hours later. It was like a scene from the apocalypse. Like every TV was like virus, COVID, NBA shut down, no travel to Europe. People in the airport are freaking out. The world changed in an instant. But there was more than that, right? Like last year, there was political division in this country like we've never experienced before that escalated into riots that escalated into people breaking into the Capitol building. We experienced things this past year where a light was shown on racial injustice in this country as has never been shown before. Where we witnessed on video the murder of a man. And suddenly, the veil that existed on what has always been was ripped off. And we had to confront 
some very serious realities. You see, those are moments that you never go back from, that we're changed collectively as. And that's on a macro level, but what about a micro level for us too? Because as we're experiencing all of this, there's this other stuff that's going on, right? Stuff that was happening prior to COVID in your life. What happened on the personal level? What happened on the level of your mental health? Because a lot of us prior to 2020 were anxious. We were sad. We wondered if the world was a safe place that we could thrive and have hope in. We wondered if people really cared about us. We wondered if we were good enough. We asked questions and we doubted and we struggled. And all of that's happening too. And all of it creates a tension that we experience. A tension that can be devastating and pull us apart. Sometimes we respond to that tension with these unexpected circumstances that can radically shift us with a desire to numb it. I would be willing to bet that there are some of you who entered 2020 without a substance abuse problem. And there are some of you who stand here tonight with a substance abuse problem. There are some of you who are choosing to numb some of the things you feel on the weekends. There are some of you who are choosing to use alcohol or drugs to numb some of what you feel on the weekdays. Sometimes you deal with it with cynicism. Well, the world's just gone to hell. It doesn't matter. Nothing can be good. We distance ourselves from the tension. Sometimes we just deal with it with doubt. Could a good God really allow all of this stuff to happen? God works in tension. I love this book. It's a Bible. A lot of people don't necessarily pick up a Bible because they don't understand exactly how it's all composed and written. They usually begin at the very start of the Bible because that's how you begin a book, right? And the very first book of the Bible is called Genesis. It means beginnings. And Genesis is kind of like a prequel. If you think of the Bible like a movie series, Genesis sets everything up. Genesis is where you get the narratives of creation and God creating the world in six days and resting on the seventh. The creation of Adam and Eve, the Tower of Babel, the flood with Noah. This is where you get the story of Abraham and the stories of Isaac and the story of Jacob, who later is called Israel. And Jacob has some sons. And one of them winds up in this place called Egypt. His name's Joseph. And through a whole series of events, Joseph winds up becoming the second in command only to Pharaoh in Egypt. And it's this incredible story where Joseph actually winds up saving all of the people in Egypt through his ability to prophesy what's going to happen. And he finds favor with Pharaoh and favor with God, and he brings his whole family, Israel, Jacob, this family that God has promised to make a great nation of. He brings them all to Egypt. And Genesis ends with Joseph dying a happy death. He's buried in the custom of the Egyptians, which means he's buried almost as a king. And then the book ends, and the real story begins. The story of God entering into the tension happens in Exodus, which is the second book of the Bible, and it begins with a cry. At the very beginning of Exodus, we get this little uh, scro- you, I like to imagine it's like the scrolling text at the beginning of Star Wars that kind of fills you in on the story. And it fills you in that the Pharaoh, the king who knew Joseph and cared for his family and cared for the Israelite people, died. And there were new kings. And as there were new kings, the Israelites multiplied. They started to become a great nation in Egypt. And then the pharaohs got concerned and started to oppress them. They gave them hard labor because they were worried about how numerous this people was becoming. And this is the setup for the story that begins here. The people of Israel groaned under their bondage because now they're slaves and cried out for help. And their cry under bondage came up to God. 
And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God saw the people of Israel, and God knew their condition. You see, God makes this promise to this people, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. I'll make you a great nation. I've got great plans for you. I'm going to do something incredible. And yet the people find themselves in tension, in bondage. They found themselves in a dire situation, something that was unexpected. Because you need to understand that the people were brought to Egypt. Jacob and his family were brought to Egypt in chariots of the king himself. Yet the tables have turned, and now they're slaves. And it's against this backdrop, against the backdrop of a cry, that the story of salvation really picks up steam. God responds to the suffering of his people. God has not forgotten his promises. God has not abandoned them. And you enter a person named Moses. This is out of Exodus chapter 3. And it's an account that maybe you've heard before, or maybe you've colored in a coloring book picture in vacation Bible school, or maybe you have no clue. And any of those three options is totally fine. But I want you to hear it with new ears. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. Now, quick backstory on Moses. The people are afraid. Pharaoh is afraid of the people, of the Israelite people. So he orders that any firstborn child who's a male, any male child, be discarded. It's horrific. Moses is going to be discarded, but Instead, he's placed in a river with hopes that someone will find him. Somebody does find him. In fact, Pharaoh's daughter finds him. Pharaoh's daughter finds this child and has pity on it. They find somebody to nurse the child who happens to be Moses' mother. And then when Moses is grown a little bit older, he's given to Pharaoh's daughter. Which means that Moses grew up in Pharaoh's house. But Moses gets in trouble because he kills an Egyptian after striking one of his fellow Hebrews. There's something in Moses, maybe when he was very young, his mother told him, you are a part of God's people. But he grows up as an Egyptian and he goes into exile. He marries somebody and starts tending the flocks of her father. And while he's doing that, he went out into the wilderness and he came to this mountain called Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and the bush was burning, but it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight. Why is this bush not burning? And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God said to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, don't come near Put your shoes off from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And Moses, and he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to see the Lord. So you have this moment where Moses is out minding his own business. He's just walking as a shepherd does, tending to these flocks in the wilderness. And then there's this sight. Suddenly something unexpected happens. There is this fire in this bush and it's not burning up. And so Moses is like, well, you don't see that every day. And a voice calls and Moses answers. Moses didn't go out expecting to find God. God came to Moses in an unexpected moment. And at that moment, Moses's life is never the same. God came to you tonight in perhaps an unexpected moment. And there's going to be stuff about this weekend that's going to take a while to unpack. This moment is the beginning of a journey for Moses, but it's not the end of a journey. What I find fascinating about this encounter is that Moses is about to be called to lead the Israelite people out of Egypt, out of slavery. And that's what God says to Moses. He says, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and I've heard their cry. I know their sufferings. And I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. God's come to restore the people. 
God heard their cry and has entered into this moment of tension, this moment of slavery, this moment where this group of people is like, could it be any better? And they probably still told stories of this God, right? I don't understand. Remember, we, we have these stories of this God, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob who promised them that they'd be a great nation. But how can we be a great nation when we're in bondage? Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever had that conversation with God? Like, God, you, you, I thought you promised me something. I thought you promised you'd be with me. I've heard people say that you'd be with me. I went to a youth conference a couple of years ago, but I don't feel like you're with me right now. Or maybe you're a little bit more like Moses than you think. Because for Moses, I'd be willing to bet this is the first time he's had a personal encounter with God. Think about it. Moses grew up in the house of Pharaoh. What gods would they have worshipped? the Egyptian gods. Maybe in his child, he had some memory of his mother as she raised him before she gave him to Pharaoh's daughter. But the likelihood is that Moses had never had a personal encounter with God other than when he went to live in his father-in-law's house. Maybe then he started to hear about this God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses doesn't have a personal relationship with God in this moment, yet God shows up and chooses him. So maybe that's you tonight. Maybe you don't really know. Maybe you're unsure. Maybe you've never had what you would consider to be a personal encounter with God. And yet, God is here with Moses. God shows up and God invites Moses into something incredible. As he works through this conversation, he says something to Moses that I find to be fascinating. God looks at Moses, says, I will be with you, because God's asking him to do something incredible, to lead a whole group of people out of Egypt, which is the most powerful nation in existence. I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you, that when I have set, that I have sent you, when you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. He's going to come back to the mountain, and this is the place where he's going to be given the Ten Commandments, where the people are going to build a covenant with God. But did you catch it? Here's going to be the sign for you, Moses, that I'm with you. You know, I want a sign, right? Like, I want to, God, if you're calling me to something, give me a sign. Show me. Give me a confirmation that you want me to do this thing. And so God's like, I'll give you a sign, Moses. After you've done all the stuff I've asked you to do, when you find yourself back on this mountain, then you'll know for sure. Why not give me a sign now? Something similar happens later on in Scripture in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is asking Jesus is walking on water. And he invites Peter to walk out on the water. Peter actually asks. Peter says, Lord, if that's you, ask me to come out on the water. And something similar happens. Jesus says to Peter, why don't you come out onto the water? And Peter steps out of the boat. But Peter doesn't get confirmation that it's actually Jesus walking on the water until he steps on the water and doesn't sink. Sometimes in our faith, we look for a sign to tell us when to go. When God is saying, I've given you enough, now I need you to step out in faith. Moses is talking to the Lord in a burning bush. In fact, Moses asked God to reveal his name to him. Who are you? When I go to the people, who should you say that I am? And God says, you can tell them my name is, I am who am. Thank you. Sometimes when you're preaching, Technology is the devil. It's true. Here's the name you're going to give them. This is an intimate moment with the Lord. This is a place of, of absolute encounter. And yet, Moses still has to take a step to respond. That's you. That's you in this moment, this weekend. 
The Lord came to be present here. And anytime there's an encounter with the Lord, we're changed. We don't always realize it, but it's, it's throughout the pages of Scripture. Anytime people encounter Jesus, they are changed radically and profoundly. The difference in how that change takes effect centers around their response. Over the next couple of days, you have a chance to respond. And I'd encourage you to do that in a vulnerable way. Moses, when he's out in the wilderness, hears somebody call his name and he responds, here I am. Think about this. That's a dangerous thing to do. He's alone. Somebody starts calling his name. He, he's giving up his location by saying, Lord, here I am. Here I am. He doesn't know who's calling to him. He makes himself vulnerable. And vulnerability is a funny thing because if you think about what it means to be vulnerable, you may have a different definition for what that looks like. I've heard this one, and I like it. Vulnerability is making something that is important to you open to the action of another. Vulnerability is taking something that is important to you and making it open to the action of another. To be vulnerable in sharing something. Let's say you have a friend and you're vulnerable so you share something that's important to you, some aspect of your life that maybe is very personal. And you give that over to them. What have you just done with it? You've given it up to the action of another. Now that person has the choice to wield that, to harm you, to gossip about you, to hold it over you. Or that person can honor it and respect it and share it with you only. This weekend, I invite you into a vulnerability with the Lord. What is it that you need to make vulnerable to God? And it's responding, here I am. Father Mike, in prayer before the Blessed Sacrament, offered a question to you, and it's a good question. Are you willing to allow God to love you exactly as you are right now? And that's the response, here I am. I'm here. And to do that is to open up in vulnerability. To take a step out and present yourself to the Lord. Because I know this, God meets us where we're at. That's what I love about this burning bush story is that it's the Lord encountering Moses, but exactly where Moses was. And what does the Lord say to Moses when he encounters him? Take your feet off for this is holy ground. When you encounter God, wherever you are at, that place becomes holy ground. It becomes a moment of sanctification. It becomes a place where all things can become new. And God wants to meet you exactly where you're at. Whatever tension that might be, if it's doubt, if it's cynicism, if it's a place where you've been numbing yourself to try to just cope with whatever reality you're existing, and God wants to meet you in that. And God wants to make that space holy and make it a place where you will find restoration and something new. When God brings the people into Egypt, God isn't done in that moment. And when God brings the people out of Egypt, he's not bringing them back to the way they were. He's restoring them to something new. The plan isn't over. You are called to something this week. To be restored, to be made new. But it requires something of you first. Here I am. I'm ready. I'm waiting. If I could go back and give myself advice, well, I can't do that, can I? It's 20 years ago. But I can give you something. I can give you a piece of advice. I can't promise immediate change. I can't promise that you're going to leave here and life is going to look radically different. I can't promise that you're going to walk away and suddenly all of your problems are going to be fixed. I can promise this, that an encounter with the Lord 
has the potential to change your life trajectory forever. That an encounter with God has the potential, if you respond to it, to set you on an adventure that you would never expect. I can promise you that when you say, here I am and encounter the Lord where you are, the place where you're at, the very ground you stand on, becomes holy. Not by virtue of the place or the situation or the song or the speaker or anything like that, but because God is there and you are there. And that encounter can change everything. The move is yours because God's made his. So what will you do? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.